Wisdom, the final frontier to true knowledge. Welcome to Wisdom Trek, where our mission is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Hello, my friend. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, your captain on our journey to increase wisdom and create a living legacy. Thank you for joining us today as we explore wisdom on our second millennium of podcast. This is day 1331 of our trek, and it is Worldview Wednesday. Creating a biblical worldview is important in order to have a proper perspective on today's current events. To establish a biblical worldview, it is required that we also have a proper understanding of God and His Word. Our focus for the next several months on Worldview Wednesday is mastering the Bible through a series of brief insights. These insights are extracted from a book by the same title from one of today's most prominent Hebrew scholars, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. This book is a collection of insights designed to help you to understand the Bible better. When we let the Bible be what it is, we can understand it as the original readers did and as original writers intended. Each week we will explore two additional insights. Today is Mastering the Bible, Ruth, and the Crucial Storylines. So insight number 41 is, the book of Ruth takes place during the days of the Judges. The period of the book of Judges was awful. The book runs through a cycle of Israel's spiritual failure, God's punishment for their faithlessness by means of foreign oppressors, desperate cries for deliverance, and God sending the judge in response. In other words, it was sin, suffer, despair, deliverance, and then repeat. One of the key things to observe in the book is that the oppressors of God's people were foreigners, people to whom the land did not belong. At times, God's instrument for punishment for sin was people groups whom Israel was supposed to have driven out of the land, but they didn't. At other times, it was people groups from the outside. The point is that the presence of foreigners meant bad things. They were very unpopular with Israelites. This is the backdrop of the story of Ruth, and the book opens with these statements from Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the days when the judges ruled Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpha, and the other a woman named Ruth. So we see that Ruth was a Moabitess, or a foreigner. The Moabites were Israel's oppressors during the judgeship of Ehud in Judges chapter 3. Israel suffered under the thumb of Eglon, the king of the Moabites, for 18 years, This can be found in Judges 3, verses 12 through 14. To many in Israel, Ruth was a symbol of an enemy. In view of this backdrop, the story of Ruth is truly remarkable. It stands to reason that no Israelite would have the slightest reason to help her. Instead, when the book's ancient readers encountered the beginning of the book, they would have expected that the people of God to make things harder for her. But Boaz was different. He was a living illustration on how Israelite was to bless the foreign nations, which is found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Even more astonishing, Ruth was destined to become the great-grandmother of King David, Ruth chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. Out of the harshest of circumstances, poverty and prejudice, and deep-seated wounds of the past, God would raise up an ideal king, whose dynasty would produce the Messiah. If we miss the context of Ruth's story, we miss the most dramatic points of impact. Now let's move on to insight number 42. In the historical books, a person's tribe and hometown are often a crucial parts of the storyline. One of the things that Dr. Heisers tell people who want to become serious students of the Bible is that they should read the historical narratives in both testaments like they are fiction. Yes, you heard correctly, fiction. Dr. Heiser doesn't say that because he thinks they are fiction. He says that because the way our minds work when we read fiction as opposed to a textbook. For example, we instinctively know that when we're reading a novel, that a locale, a line, or even a word might pop up later in the story. 
we are alert to the fact that the author is doing things to direct our reading. That's precisely how we need to read historical books. They aren't textbooks. Israel's history are presented to us as a story, and the people who wrote these stories were clever storytellers. The problem is that the hints that they drop to lead the reader in one direction or another are often lost on us because we live in another time and place. One of the best examples of a fence's story is in Judges chapter 19, where a certain Levite allowed his concubine to be repeatedly sexually abused. The woman died from the incident, prompting the Levite to exact vengeance, but not until he had dismembered the woman's body. On the surface, this repulsive episode reminds us that in the time of Judges, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, Judges chapter 17 verse 6 and chapters 21 verse 25. But there is more to it than that. To catch the depth of the meaning, we need to recall that the Judges was written centuries after its events, during the period of time after the days of Solomon, when the kingdom split in two. The Levite in our story was from the hill country of Ephraim, Judges chapter 19 verse 1, which the readers of the time would immediately associate with the heart of the apostate northern kingdom. The Levite is thus cast as a villain in the first verse. The concubine, on the other hand, was from Bethlehem of Judah, chapter 19, verse 2, which was the town of David, who was the ideal king. The woman had run away from her home, and now the Levite had come to Bethlehem to bring her back, Judges chapter 19, verses 3 through 9. On the way home, the Levite servant suggested they spend the night in Jebus, which was another name for Jerusalem, which would become the city of David, Judges chapter 19, verse 10. The Levite rejected this idea, since the city was under the control of foreigners considered Gentiles. Instead, they went to Gibeah, Judges chapter 19, verse 12. Gibeah was a city in the territory of Benjamin, the tribe of Saul, who was Israel's first king and an enemy to David. It was in Gibeah where this horrible abuse occurred. The men of Gibeah, associated with Saul, are rapists and killers. The Levite sends pieces of the woman's body to the rest of the tribes and demands revenge, Judges chapter 19, verses 29 and 30. The resulting incident that closes the book of Judges is that the tribe of Benjamin is nearly exterminated, but eventually they are spared. Ancient Israelites' reader would see the victim associated with David's suffering at the hands of the people associated with Saul. The writer was preparing them for the loyalty to David and his line, By the time they read the last line in the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25, which is, In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. The author of Judges had their readers right where he wanted them. And that will conclude this week's lesson on another two insights from Dr. Heiser's book, Mastering the Bible. Next Worldview Wednesday, we will continue with two additional insights. I believe that you'll find each Worldview Wednesday an interesting topic to consider as we build our biblical worldview. Tomorrow we will continue with the three-minute humor nugget that will provide you with a bit of cheer to help you to lighten up and live a rich and satisfying life. So encourage your friends and family to join us and to come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. If you'd like to listen to any of the past 1,330 treks or read the Wisdom Journals, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Wisdom Trek on your favorite podcast player so that each day's trek will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor. But most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life, together let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and then leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to... Keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and then create a great day every day. See you tomorrow.